Welcome back to Philosophy for Flourishing, the show where we explore principles and practices for living the best, most fulfilled life possible. I know it's been a little while. I have been busy giving talks both in person and remote. And because some of those talks relate directly to the theme of this podcast, I've decided to share a bit of what I've been up to. So today what I've got for you is a talk that I recently gave at Arizona State University for a great program called Project Arizona that I urge you guys to check out. It's put on by a friend of mine, Yasek Spendel. He is the president of Liberty International. This talk is titled Ayn Rand's Place in Intellectual History, and I get into pretty quickly why that's relevant to our situation today and to flourishing more broadly. So I won't rehash that here. Let me know what you think in the comments. Subscribe, tell your friends about it, all that good stuff, and enjoy the show. Oh, and one more quick thing. Of course, I was at the university, not in my home recording studio, so the sound quality is not quite as good as I would have liked, but it is what it is, and I hope it's not too distracting for you. But here it is. Thank you, Yasik, for having me. I think Project Arizona is just a really incredible program, and we saw some of the fruits of it. Last night, a few of us went and saw Jorge speak. Jorge is a uh, a graduate and an alumnus of Project Arizona, and he's just doing incredible work now, talking about what's going on in Venezuela. So I'm sure that some of you are wondering what intellectual history has to do with the problems that we face in the world today. And so let me just address that right at the start. When we look out at the world, we see a mad dictator who is trying to resurrect the Soviet Union. Uh, over the, the innocent lives of Ukrainians. When we look at China, we see uh, another regime that is encroaching on the freedoms of Hong Kongers and of Taiwan as well, abducting their own people. And they've got millions of people, mostly Muslims, in re-education camps in China as well. And re-education is, that's the name of the game in, in North Korea. Uh, they start re-educating. It's just synonymous with education there. It is pure propaganda and indoctrination from day one. And you know, no one there is, is able to live a fully human life. Venezuela, as we said, is, is being crushed under the boot of a socialist regime. And when we look over to the you know, classic sort of Western liberal democracies, we see the rise of authoritarianism as well, uh, especially in response to COVID-19 with lockdowns and now vaccine mandates in many countries, forcing people to give up their bodily autonomy to become vaccinated, to, be, to, to trust the science, so to speak. So we see the rise of authoritarianism in the world and what I would say is that there's an underlying cause here. The underlying cause is that the, the fundamental ideas that have been accepted the world over are driving the world in the direction that it's going. And this wasn't uh, my unique insight. This, of course, was Ayn Rand's observation. She thought that the philosophy of a culture is, is entirely... Uh, indicative of the direction that that culture will go in. So I liken it to an operating system. If a computer's operating system is vulnerable to viruses that shut down man's mind and enslave it to malignant purposes, then you get the Dark Ages, the Third Reich. You get Mao's great leap into the abyss, and you get all of the craziness that we're seeing today. And if that operating system, if those fundamental ideas are healthy and robust, then you get the scientific revolution. You get the industrial revolution. You get the American revolution. So the, these ideas, where do they come from? They don't come out of thin air, right? They come from the intellectuals of our cultures. One of the things that Jorge said yesterday that I thought was really interesting was that when socialism came to Venezuela in, in the 70s, I believe he said, it didn't come through the, the mass of people clamoring for socialism. It came from the intellectuals, it came from the academy. It was transmitted to Venezuela through the academy. And if we 
want a robust freedom movement, one that's effective in fighting back, then what we need to do is we need to understand the depth of the problem. You know, I work in the, in, in the freedom movement, as Klaus mentioned. I work for uh, a, an objectivist magazine that promotes reason, freedom, capitalism. I work for Foundation for Economic Education. I go to a lot of conferences. I help host a conference. And what I see, the, the one problem that I see with the freedom movement is that many people seem to underestimate the depth of the problem that we are facing. Make no mistake, the ideas, the arguments against freedom are a virus that has been around for millennia. And that virus has continued to mutate and become more and more potent. And so if we want to be effective in staving off the tyrants, the authoritarians, we need to understand that intellectual history. We need to understand the role of ideas in, in determining the world. We need to be able to communicate about those, those ideas effectively. So that's why we're going to talk about intellectual history today. Just a couple of examples of why this is so important. I have a friend who's an economist from George Mason University. He's a, a very intelligent guy. And when COVID hit, he put together a petition against the anti-price gouging laws. <clears throat> and he got more than 100 PhDs in economics to sign this thing. When he got it in front of politicians and the mainstream media, their very simple question was, well, isn't this immoral? What is this going to do to the poor people who can't afford things if we have this law that doesn't keep the, the prices from rising when demand rises? And he didn't have any ready answer for that question. And so his petition died, and it did not change the public conversation one iota. So the point here is there is an ethical idea underlying a political idea. And if we don't have answers to ethical questions, then we cannot solve political problems. Another example. I have a friend who's also, uh, he's an economic writer, he's not an economist. And he's, he's a great guy. He likes to make the argument, though, that von Mises made, which is that there's no scientific ought, meaning that science gives us the facts, but it cannot tell us what we ought to do with those facts. And he brought this up in the context of COVID-19, because we have, again, we have these authoritarians telling us dogmatically that this is what you have to do. This is the science. Follow the science. And so very uh, honorable motive here. But does anyone see a problem with this sort of argument that the science can never give us an ought? What do you guys think? Do you, you think that's a solid ground to be arguing on? Harley? Absolutely. I think that if you're looking at like the uh, atomic energy, right? Uh, there's nothing within atomic or fusion or splitting an atom, okay, that's going to tell you whether you should do like a, a nuclear pocket plant to sure. provide green yeah. energy or if you're there's a whole stuff. vast range between the science and what we should do on that. Yeah. But th think about it like this: What is the average person likely to think if you say, "Well, science can't give us any odds"? Well, where does this idea even come from? It actually comes from the Scottish Enlightenment. It comes from David Hume. Mm -hmm. David Hume said that there's, there's no such thing as causation or that we have no evidence upon which to base our ideas about causation. If a, a boy throws a rock and he hits that window behind us and he smashes that window, he'd say, well, we see a rock, we see the window shattering, we, we don't see any necessary connection. We never see any necessary connection. He's a radical empiricist. All we have is the information right in front of us, and therefore we have no means of reaching any sort of inductive generalizations. Now, if you tell the average person that, for instance, well, I have a headache, and the science tells me that aspirin will cure my headache, that science doesn't give us any odds, they're going to be a bit suspicious. They're not really going to understand why you're saying that. I think that this is a mistake, and it's it's a, a philosophic mistake 
There, of course, like you said, Harley, there is a vast gap between what the science tells us and what we ought to do on that science. But in the history of philosophy, there's something known as the is-ought gap. And that is exactly what David Hume brought to the fore when he wrote this about necessary causation. There's this gap between what is and what we ought to do about it, and it cannot be bridged. So I want you guys to keep that is-ought gap in mind as we go through some more ideas from intellectual history. I think it's a mistake, though, to be on the side of David Hume in that argument. But that is a good segue all the way back to ancient Greece, because this argument has roots in ancient Greece, like pretty much every single philosophic argument does. It goes back to the sophists of ancient Greece. Our word sophisticated comes from the sophists. My friend, Dr. Andrew Bernstein, a philosopher, put it really well. He said that the, their, their idea of sophisticated and not being naive, being worldly wise, is thinking that there's no such thing as objective truth. We look at the, out at the world, and much like David Hume said, we, we uh, see a bunch of concretes. We can't induce generalizations from those concretes. But their point was mostly about the fact that there's relativity, relativity in perception. So, for instance, last night I went to Five Guys with a, a group of the Project Arizona people. And Stephen put me to shame because I thought I could handle the peppers that they have at Five Guys. I put it in my mouth and I immediately regretted it. <laughs> I, was, I was crying, I got the hiccups. And meanwhile, he's sitting there, straight-faced, no sign whatsoever, stone cold, just chowing them down. So. There's this difference in perception, right? For me, this thing is incredibly hot. For you, it's not. What's true for me is not true for you. And if all our knowledge is built on perception, then our concepts, like things like justice and virtue, well, do those have any basis in reality? Perhaps they don't. Perhaps there is no such thing as truth or justice, and so might makes right. And Thrasymachus, who is famous to us from Plato's Republic, said exactly that, might makes right. So Plato, student, if you know anything about Plato, you know he's the student of Socrates, and all of his writings were in the form of dialogues between Socrates and some other interlocutor. And Plato was, uh, you know, he was, he was a fairly young boy when Socrates made himself obnoxious to the people of Athens, especially to some prominent people, some important people because he was very, very interested in fighting back against these sophistic arguments about there being no basis for concepts like virtue or justice or knowledge. He wanted to ground our moral and epistemological concepts in objective fact. He wanted to say there is a basis for believing what we believe. And so he went around Athens and he spoke to various well-connected and influential people and Lo and behold, these people who thought they had a good grasp on what justice was, what virtue was, what piety was, their definitions fell apart and they couldn't defend them. And they realized that their own accounts were self-contradictory in many cases. And so Socrates, known as the gadfly of Athens because he just annoyed so many people by doing this, was put on trial on trumped up, trumped up charges of corrupting the youth and of behaving impiously. And as we know, Socrates was put to death by hemlock by the Athenian democracy. Now, Plato saw this and he was horrified, and rightly so. He was horrified that an unlimited democracy was able to put one of Athens' greatest men to death because he had ideas that they didn't share. And so he, he very, uh, rightly saw problems with democracy, with unlimited majority rule. But his solution, his idea of what to do about this was to unite knowledge or wisdom and political power in one and the same person. He wanted for kings to become philosophers or philosophers to become kings. Wisdom and knowledge united in the same person. Now, in order to do that, of course, in order to erect his ideal state, he needs to convince people that there actually is something as knowledge. Because as we've heard from the sophists, well, what's true for you is not true for me. So Plato had a good motive here. He wanted to solve this 
knowledge problem, I guess we could call it, not the same as von Mises. And the way he went about doing that, though, was extremely destructive to the history of the world. I think it was Voltaire who said, oh, Plato, you have no idea how much destruction you have wrought on the world, something to that effect. His solution was to posit this other world of immaterial, non-spatial forms, he called them, or ideas. And these forms, perhaps you've heard this, they were just perfect non-spatial patterns upon which everything in reality is based. And the things that we see here in the room, for instance, Plato would say, well, you know, this is just a, an imperfect reflection of what out in the world of forms is actually a perfect water bottle. And because it's materially manifested, it has all these imperfections that we can never get rid of. The same thing with men, with man, all of us, all people. They're just imperfect reflections of the form of man outside in another realm over and above us. And that form of man is more important than any individual man. That is the truth. What we see here is, it's false. It's just a, it's just a reflection of something, it's, it's fake. We have to turn away from the evidence of perception as much as we can. The masses of people can't do it. They're busy, they're living their lives, going about their days, they're taking care of their kids, they're going to work. But you know who can? The intellectual elite. They can shut themselves up in their ivory towers or go to Plato's Academy, presumably, and put on their togas and think about these perfect forms. You know, one of the ways that we can get there is by doing lots of mathematics, because mathematics abstracts away from all the messy concretes of our world, right? Mathematics, that is the ideal subject, said Plato, because there's no messy concretes to lead us astray. <clears throat> so this is, perhaps you already see some of the consequences of this sort of idea of saying that only a small elite of people have access to knowledge. And those people, because they have a monopoly on knowledge, ought to have a monopoly on political power. They ought to rule. And so Plato's ideal state, now based upon this theory of knowledge, he's solved the problem of the, of the sophists, or so he thinks, and he's ready to build his ideal state, and so he does. And what he gives us is, if you've read George Orwell's 1984, or if you know the history of the 20th century, then you have a good idea of exactly what he proffered because those, he, he gave us the blueprint of every dictatorship in history. He said that we need philosopher kings to tell us what to do. They must ensure that the art that we consume is uh, appropriate for our, our people. We want it to instill loyalty and patriotism. Uh, we can't have anything that shows non-virtuous people succeeding in any way, shape, or form. We can't have music that is soft or sentimental or tender in any way. We need music that will give us warriors. Education. Well, of course, the state can force people to do things, but that's really inefficient, don't you think? to use all this force to force people around? Why don't we just indoctrinate everyone? Let's we'll use the educational system to tell them what to think and to make them loyal to us. And then they won't ask questions. They'll just go about their lives and, and we can rule over them. Eugenics. You know, we, we've heard about eugenics from, from the Nazis. And, but Plato, he had this idea back in ancient Greece. Well, just like we breed good dogs, you know, he said to his friend, I think it was Glaucon, Hey, you know, you've got dogs and, and birds, you breed animals, um, but don't you make sure to, to breed the best with the best? Yeah, of course I do. Well, we'll need to do the best. We'll, we'll need to breed the best of the best to get the best rulers. So what we'll do is we'll set up a lottery system in which we'll tell everyone that uh, your, your mate will be chosen for you by lottery. But behind the scenes, you know, we'll, we'll flip things around and we'll make sure the, the best mate with the best. So. What do we have here with Plato? We're incapable of knowledge. And what we need, because we're incapable of knowledge, is a, is a government that will tell us what to do, that will rule over us. When 
Thomas Jefferson read the, the Republic, he said he had to put it down over and over again and ask himself how it was that so many centuries of people had lavished such praise on this book. And he was writing this, I believe, to John Adams, who responded, I learned only two things from Plato's Republic, and one of them was that sneezing cures the hiccups. <laughs> yes, thankfully, Plato's Republic had an answer, and thankfully that answer came quickly from the works of Aristotle. Aristotle was born in Macedonia, sort of the Texas of ancient Greece, a little rough around the edges, I guess you'd say. And when he was 17, he came to Athens to complete his education. He went to Plato's Academy, and he ended up staying there for 20 years, much of that time as a student, but also some of that time as an educator as well. And, you know, there's this great image, the School of Athens by Raphael, this is, our, uh, this, is, this is a modification of it that I had made, as you can probably tell. But in the School of Athens, I mean, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and luckily this is gonna save me a bunch of time because I know Yasik is looking at the clock and he's a little worried. This picture will save us a lot of time because here we see Plato, and he's on my right, I guess your left, pointing up at the sky. He's pointing up at the world of forms, right? That is where truth lies. And Aristotle is motioning down, he's gesturing down to this earth this world, this reality, this is where truth is. This captures the distinction between Plato and Aristotle perfectly. So let's flesh it out just a little. Existence, this realm, this is where truth is. It says in the metaphysics, we begin with the fact. Facts are interesting things. What are facts? They're parts of reality as grasped by us. We're able to grasp reality. How do we do that? Well, perception actually is a source of knowledge, not as the sophists say and not as Plato conceded, it is not. No, the, the senses are a source of knowledge. In fact, the senses cannot lie to us. The senses give us knowledge. The problem is that often when we interpret that data, we do so incorrectly. And so we come to all sorts of, you know, the, the pepper thing. Well, there are different causal factors at play. We'll talk more about the causal factors thing when we get to Ayn Rand. <clears throat> Concepts. Well, the one and the many, as, the, as this problem is put in classical philosophy, what is the one thing that gives rise to all the many appearances? And Plato gives us the answer, it's the forms. We have the one form that gives rise to all these unreal appearances. Well, Aristotle said, no, you're wrong again, Plato. You know, you're a nice guy, I liked you as my teacher, but I've got to correct you here. What gives rise, what connects all of the things that are, are alike is the fact that they have similar characteristics. And we can look out at the world using our perception, we can see these different objects, and we can classify them, we can group them by those characteristics. And then we can use that to reason about it. Not only did Aristotle say, no, the senses are valid, but also that's not where knowledge stops. We can keep going. We can build conceptual knowledge on top of that. And Aristotle gave us not only an account of concepts, but also of logic. He's the father of logic. He's also the father of modern biology. If you go read his history of animals, he goes on for pages and pages and pages about the development of a chicken embryo. He knew that we could use the senses and use reason and use logic to learn about reality, and thus man's reason is efficacious here and in this world. Unlike Plato, reason, uh, Aristotle held that reason is efficacious. And we ought to use reason, what should be the purpose of our lives? Well, all things aim at the good, right? He, he famously opens up his Nicomachean ethics by saying everything, everyone, they, they aim at the good whether or not they actually reach it, whether or not they actually have a concept of what the good actually is. Some people go astray. Some people think that the good is pleasure. Some people think that it's honor. These people are mistaken. But there is a good, and the good is actualizing the potential of a thing. What is man's unique potential? How does he differ from plants and animals? Well, he has reason. Flourishing for man is action in accordance with reason. 
And so in order to live a fully human life, he has to be able to act according to the judgment of his own mind. And where does this lead us for politics? Well, Aristotle said there are actually many different forms of government that could work. But what we need to, to figure out is, given the context, what will best enable flourishing? What will help people flourish? Now, perhaps a few times in history, there's been one person that is just head and shoulders above everybody else in virtue and in knowledge. And so perhaps, maybe, sometimes, there is a role for monarchy. But by and large, power corrupts. And when you have a, a larger group, there's a far less chance that you're going to, to corrupt the judgment of a, of a large group of people. So democracy is safer than monarchy. But the key point, Aristotle points out, is that there must be a constitution of laws. There must be laws. Because without those laws, what we have is a, a dictator acting on whim. And so men, in order to flourish, in order to be able to act on their nature as men, need to be able to use their reasoning minds, and they need to be able to self-govern. Aristotle would not have been satisfied with our modern forms of representative government. And he didn't think that the state should be too big because he thought that every person should self-govern. They should be involved in making the laws and sitting in on jury duty and fighting for their country if need be. So Aristotle, as you can probably tell, gave us the operating system of progress, the operating system that made possible the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, the American revolution. Those ideas were transmitted through the Enlightenment by John Locke, whose essays concerning human understanding gave us an extremely Aristotelian epistemology, albeit with some modern problems that we can talk about in the Q&A if you guys want to. And he gave us the two treatises of civil government, which of course became the basis for the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution. When Jefferson said uh, what he was doing with the Declaration was expressing the American mind, he meant the American mind as impacted by John Locke. John Locke, his words were on the, the tips of every tongue in America. His two treatises of civil government was quoted so often and so verbatim that people did not even bother to cite it. It was just taken for granted that everybody knew where these ideas were coming from. If we trace those ideas back, they go all the way back to Aristotle. Unfortunately, some of the problems that John Locke did introduce into epistemology while trying to solve problems that had crept in via Descartes and go further back, other uh, Middle Ages philosophers, and even back to Plato and Aristotle, there were problems. But the person who cultivated these problems into a weed that would eventually choke off the tree of knowledge was Immanuel Kant. Kant, this is, might sound strange to some of you who've read Kant and, and know a bit about Kant, because Kant actually coined the term enlightenment. But Kant fundamentally, his fundamental ideas were anti-enlightenment. And they really set the clock back. And unfortunately, his ideas have been incredibly impactful and influential on the centuries since. Let's talk about why. So Kant was responding to Hume. We heard earlier about Hume's problem with induction. You know, we see the stone hitting the glass, we see the glass breaking, but we don't see any necessary connection. Well, how do we solve that problem, asked Kant? Well, if we go by the typical correspondence theory of truth, where the mind has to grasp reality, and that is true, though, then we have a serious problem, because as, as Hume pointed out, we can never see necessary causation. We have no evidence that it exists. But what if, and he was a big fan of Copernicus, Copernicus had spearheaded this Copernican revolution by saying, well, the Earth doesn't act, Earth is not actually at the center of the universe, guys. The sun's not revolving around the Earth. Rather, the Earth is revolving around the sun. So Kant had his own Copernican revolution. He said, well, what if instead of the mind grasping reality, the mind actually shapes reality? It actually creates the reality that we experience. What if 
David Stove, a great philosopher, hilarious to read, wrote that Kant gave us the, the simplest but most audacious bluff ever tried. And he pulled it off. He bluffed. He said, what if? And then he took all of us along for the ride. So he said that the mind does shape reality. And here he is latching on to, again, certain confusions throughout modern philosophy about what it is that happens with perception. So if we do perceive things even slightly differently, if the world, if our senses don't give us reality exactly as it is, with this mirror-like mode of representation, then we have a serious problem. So Kant said that our minds have these inbuilt categories. They're kind of like filters. Sort of like if you were wearing like rose-colored glasses, you'd see everything in that color. Well, these categories, though, are what give us space, time, causality. The reason that we see a spatial, temporal world with causation, the reason that we do, it's not because there's anything about reality that is giving us that. It's because our minds are implanting those qualities into the world that we see. Now, the mind doesn't create laws of physics and things like that. There are some sort of basic ground rules, but it, it creates the basis for all experience, it creates the, the basis for experience in general. And so you can think about it like this. If our experience is this sort of tapestry, what the mind brings to that tapestry is it brings the pattern and it brings the loom. And then experience brings the thread. And together they collaborate and then we get the world as we perceive it. Well, that raises a question then, doesn't it? If what we perceive is this creation of our minds, then what's actually out there? How do we get to the truth? How do we get to real knowledge? Kant said we can't. There's another realm, he calls it the noumenal realm. This realm is the phenomenal realm. In this realm, everything is governed by scientific laws of cause and effect. You have no free will in this realm. You don't determine your own actions. Perhaps, perhaps there's free will in the noumenal realm, but we're entirely cut off from it. I, Immanuel Kant, am the only person that knows it exists somehow because I found the magic doorway and so can tell all of you, I can come back and tell all of you how the world actually works. Now, we cannot know anything about this noumenal realm, which was very convenient for Kant. He was a pietist. He grew up in a pietist uh, Christian household. And if Christianity in general, if the difference between that in ancient Greece was that the Greeks looked at what is required for flourishing. Traditionally, Christians looked at what is our duty? What do we need to do? How do we appease an otherworldly God? And if the traditional, so the pietists, just a, a little background, splintered off from the Reformation. The Reformation had splintered off from, from the Catholic Church that the Catholic Church was too lax, it was too lenient in its understanding of Christianity. So Martin Luther, with his theses nailed to the church door, started a revolution in Christianity. The Pietists started another one. They broke off, as many forms of, of Reformation Christianity did, broke off, and if, if the, uh, the Presbyterians, or the, sorry, that's not the right word, the Protestants, if they were pious, well, the pietists were all the more so. They were the most pious of the pious. And so Kant actually says, he congratulates himself in the introduction to his uh, critique of pure reason, that he's, he found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. How did he do that? Well, he's just cu cut the, two, the world into two realms, which that should sound familiar. Isn't that exactly what Plato did? So again, we have two realms. This realm, we'll give that to the scientists. Give to the scientists what is the scientists. Give to the theologians what is the theologians. And that is the real world, the noumenal realm that we can never actually experience. We don't know if it actually exists or not. We can't be sure. But believing that it does is justified because we have this deep feeling we can use our emotions here as a means of cognition. We have a deep feeling that that realm does exist. What, is, what does it tell us to do? What does this knowledge tell us to do? 
it acts as a regulative principle concept. We can't actually know if it exists, but it's kind of like if you were standing, say, somewhere in Phoenix, looking out at a highway that stretches out into the sun, and somewhere beyond the sun, that road ends. But you never see the end of that road. You just think, well, it's got to be in that general direction. Well, that's what Kant said that these regulative principles do. We can't actually see into that other realm, but we think it, it stretches off and ends somewhere in that general direction. Perhaps somebody else thinks it veers off to the left or the right. I don't know. But what we do know is that if it's completely cut off from reason, then it's also immune to any attack by scientists. It's immune to any criticism, any rational criticism. And so that's what Kant meant when he said he was, he was denying knowledge in order to make room for faith. What sort of politics do you think this would lead to? Well, let's, let's keep going with Kant. So duty is a central premise of, of Kant's philosophy. Uh, what is our duty? Our duty is to do that for which we have no inclination. Now, Aristotle had said we ought to act to achieve our own flourishing. To do that, we need to observe reality, come up with some moral principles. But in order to apply those principles, we need a whole bunch of contextual knowledge. There's no such thing as you, thou shalt, because those wouldn't take into account the, the differences in context. It's very hard to apply a moral principle. You know, should you lie? Should you never lie? Well, I don't know. Are there Nazis at the door? Is somebody, is a, is a gang trying to abduct my wife? Perhaps there are instances in which there are, are legitimate le reasons to break thou shalt. Kant said, no such thing. No, there, is, there should be no context brought to the equation. What you should do is you should act as if your action could be a universal maxim. It could set the, the action for all of humanity but you cannot have any inclination to do the thing that you're going to do. Because as soon as you have any inclination, and here he's, he's leveraging our immediate distaste for double standards. We know that if we have a principle, and if somebody doesn't really feel like doing it, well, maybe they'll come up with some rationalization to get around doing what they should actually do. So Khan is leveraging our, our, our logical, legitimate distaste for double standards but he's saying that you should have absolutely no inclination to, to do any of the actions that you undertake. In fact, he gave an example, which I think is just so eye-opening. He said that you could be, for instance, this great philanthropist, and you could give your money to charity, and you could make meals for your name. He doesn't give these exact concretes, but he gives this general idea. You could you know, bring their kids to movies and buy them school supplies. But if you, if you get even an ounce of joy out of that, that's no longer moral. You're not actually doing your duty. That has no moral worth. Perhaps it's good, perhaps it's benevolent, but it's not, it's not moral. That has no moral worth because you actually wanted to do it. Now, by contrast, if you hated life, if you were just Scrooge, for instance, you hated everybody, but instead of being visited by the ghosts of Christmas past, you just continued hating life. But you decided, even though you hate life, just that it was your duty to act against your inclination, to, to give to your employees, to make their lives better. Well, that would be moral. As long as you hated doing it, you should do what you have no inclination to do. You should do what you hate doing. So now let me ask the question again. What sort of politics do you think that would lead to? Sounds like anarchy. Anarchy. Do, yeah, that's, that's not a bad answer. Because what Kant is doing is he's trying to say that, uh, that ethics have this objective basis and that people shouldn't act on double standards. He's, he's sort of in, indicating that he's going in that direction. But what is he actually doing? He's saying, well, you should act on what you think should be a universal maxim. Well, then he's actually subjectivizing ethics. He's saying it's, ethics is whatever you think. That's what it amounts to. I mean, there's, there's no factual basis for ethics in Kant's, Kant's ethics. There's no factual basis for any sort of moral principle. The principle is just don't do what you want to do, and you'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, Kant voiced some superficial support for freedom and limited government, and he gave us this concept of enlightenment. But actually, 
When it came down to the wire, and Kant wrote this essay called Perpetual Peace, and he you know, poses this, this question, what people ought to do if a dictator violates their rights? Well, they ought to lay down their lives and let them, let them trample them. And you can go read this, Perpetual Peace, very interesting essay. So we should tolerate dictators. That doesn't sound much like John Locke, does it? It doesn't sound like the right to revolution when governments infringe our rights. Now, Kant thought that these categories are universal, that you and I and everybody of every race and every type, everyone on earth, every rational consciousness puts reality together in the same way. But that solidity of his idea, that, that unity of his idea, would soon be shattered by his followers. Hegel, a German philosopher, follower of Kant, said, well, actually, yeah, there are these categories that shape reality, but they change from generation to gener generation. They evolve over time. And Marx, who was a good Hegelian, I think he joined the young Hegelians, Marx splintered that even further. He said, these categories are not universal. Are you kidding me? You, you're rich, you're poor, you guys see the world differently. You have different categories. You have different logics even. Polylogism comes out of Marxism. We have different means of seeing the world. These come from Kant's categories. These things that, these filters through which we see the world, but never actual reality. We're incapable of seeing actual reality. And this was splintered further by the postmodernists who have turned this entire mess into a seething culture war by splintering us up into every imaginable group. If you go back far enough, it all goes back to Kant, to Aristotle, to Plato. Where does Rand fit into all of this? Rand's aim was to save the Enlightenment by reviving the this-worldly epistemology, ethics, politics of Aristotle, and fortifying those ideas against the anti-life ideas that came out of Kant's philosophy in the 19th century that followed him. Existence exists. Existence has primacy over consciousness. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed. She quoted Francis Bacon verbatim. The mind cannot just create reality. It has to observe reality. It has to grasp reality. Perception is valid. Our means of perception are valid. I mentioned a problem earlier that came up with Locke. Locke said, well, what we actually perceive are our ideas. We never actually perceive the outside world. We just perceive ideas in our minds. That's all we ever perceive, which obviously leads to problems that led to, to Bishop Barclay saying, well, how do we know there isn't any external world? And then we get this bizarre philosophy of a person who actually contends that there is no physical world, that the world that we experience is just our minds and God basically playing the matrix in our minds and giving us all of our experiences in our minds directly. So we have this snowballing effect in, in modern philosophy that, again, is, is anti-sense perception. Rand says, look, everything that exists, just as Aristotle said, everything that exists has a specific nature. Now, the nature of the entities involved in any causal relation matters, of course. So there are objects of perception, this picture here, that wall there, that column. And there are means of perception, eyes, ears, nose, mouth. The means of perception, the nature of those means of perception matters. It's causally relevant. It doesn't mean that those means of perception are actually deceiving us. It just means that they operate according to natural causal law. And they cannot do otherwise. When we see a stick, a straight stick, in water, bent, and we conclude that our senses are dece deceiving us because we pull the stick out and it's straight. Well, are our senses actually deceiving us? Rand says, no. The, the, the senses cannot ignore any relevant causal knowledge that they can directly perceive. In this case, we directly perceive, although we don't conceptually understand, the fact that light travels through air and water at different velocities. That's important. That's very helpful. The senses are good. They don't deceive us. They're our means of knowledge. They're our means of understanding the world. Concepts. What about concepts? Well, if, like the sophists said, 
our, all of our knowledge is, is illusory. There is no such thing as knowledge. The truth is relative. Uh, our concepts are based on perception, right? They're our basis of reasoning. So if we don't have valid concepts that actually apply, actually describe the real world, then we have a serious problem because then all of our conceptual knowledge goes out the window. So Aristotle had pointed out, well, what we're doing is we're classifying different things based on similar characteristics. That didn't really, that didn't really satisfy a lot of people. They said, well, I look out at the world and it just, it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah, you can say that these things have some similar characteristics, these water bottles that are all around the room. But if we look at them, the particular matter is entirely individuated. They're all different in every you know, possible way. Well, Rand said that we form concepts via measurement omission. We see similar characteristics out there in the world, all of these chairs, for instance. There are all sorts of different chairs. Some of them don't even have legs. Some are held up by cables, and you can swing in them. Triangles or squares. What is it that we're doing when we're forming these concepts? Well, we're looking out at the world, we're observing similar characteristics, but then we're omitting the specific measurements. The measurements don't matter. They must exist in some quality, in some quantity, but they may exist in any quantity. The sum but any principle. This explains how we come to objective concepts. There's much more to it. I can only scratch the surface. So we form concepts via measurement omission. The purpose of ethics is to, to show us how to live our lives and flourish. Where does ethics come from? Is it, uh, is it just out of a book somewhere? Does it fall from the sky? Why do we have ethics? What is the purpose of ethics? Well, in general, ethics, the purpose of ethics is to be a code of values to guide man's choices and actions, is how Rand put it. And that's applicable to any code of ethics. Doesn't matter. It's a code of values to guide man's choices and actions. Well, why do we need values? What are they for? Well, we're living beings. We don't gain and keep certain values just like any living beings, our lives go out of existence. So we need values to, to sustain our lives and to flourish. And when people take the initiative of their own accord to make their own lives great by creating those values upon which life, uh, life is sustained, they ought to keep those values. They have a right to those values just as they are human beings. They have a right to live according to their human nature by using reason to produce the values on which life depends. The only political system that enables people to do this, the only system that is consonant with man's nature as a human being is capitalism. The only system that recognizes that man has rights. So, in sum, Rand aimed to revive the this worldly Aristotelian approach to ethics and to give us the answer to many of the philosophic problems, many of the, the problems in intellectual history that have led to authoritarianism. She said, what this country needs, referring to the US, is a philosophical revolution, a rebellion against the Kantian tradition in the name of our first found, the first of our founding fathers, Aristotle. This means a reassertion of the supremacy of reason with its consequences, individualism, freedom, progress, and civilization. Thank you. I know Harley's got questions. He wants to fight me. I was just saying back through the whole time, and it's fascinating just to hear you talk about all the different philosophers all the way back from Aristotle and Plato to get to Immanuel Kant to get to today. And like it's really informative, so I, I find it very fascinating. So, and also being someone about to ask you a question, like pretty much agrees with you, or in the ninetieth percentile with probably just about anything uh, that you've said. Uh, when you look at the problem of of evil, like when you look at you were talking about eugenics and when someone breeds a dog, they breed a breast dog, or when you look at what's happening in Ukraine, and you can say, well, he's just a madman. But really, if you get into Putin's mind, he's thinking, wow, I, I can rebuild the USSR. I mean, you can really get a rational 
train of thought, perverted evil, but, but a rational train of thought, like as someone trying to rebuild an empire. Um, how do you, as an objectivist, like, as like coming up faced with questions like, I think Anne Rand, she said, God was the greatest invention of man. What? Yeah, actually. I don't know that. And then, no, it's, it's Oh, well, true. yeah, perhaps she, she did. Invention makes sense invention, in that context. Invention. And, and she, she did, ironically, I agree with her. And I'm getting to my question, I swear. Okay. Uh, I run, and her problem with it was it, it stripped from man the issues of morality, kind of like what you were talking about, the issue of, of man being able to use reason uh, and, and brought in altruism, which was problematic, and, and instead of like self-interest, which led to, to really wonderful things. So, but how do you address the problems like uh, of evil? How do you address like if, if might makes right, it doesn't. Oh, well, okay. So on what basis do you make that statement? On the basis of the requirements of human life, on the, the facts of human nature that give rise to values, that give rise to rights, and the fact that no one has a, a right to take your property. You earned it through your own effort. Your effort was individual. It was created by you, by your own free will. And so it is completely immoral for somebody to take that away from you. Now. I think that what you're getting at is that perhaps religion and any form of morality that is widely accepted has some positive use. I think that Rand would heavily disagree with that, of course, because she thinks when you undercut reason, when you undercut man's mind, his ability to get to reality directly, then all sorts of horrific consequences follow. She said something like, it is better for you to, to accept uh, 10 absurdities on the basis of your own reason than to accept one falsehood on the basis of faith. Because if you give up your mind, you give up your means of telling the difference. Voltaire said, you know, if, if I can make you believe absurdities, I can make you commit atrocities. Well, how is that actually done? It's done through indoctrination. It's done through removing people's connection with reality taking away their ability to reason for themselves. Now, has Christianity done that throughout history? I think certainly we can uh, point to many instances in which it has. I also am sympathetic, at least, to arguments like the one that Benjamin Franklin made, where he, he wrote to an atheist, and he said, well, and Franklin was a deist. He didn't think that God interfered with the universe, but he thought that religion was useful it's like a crutch to those who don't know better. He thought that when you're, when you're best to others, you're, you're, when you're good to others, you're best to yourself. That the reason, if there was a God, the reason he commanded certain things was that those things were good. It's not that they're good because God commanded them. He thought God commanded them because they're good. They're good in themselves. They're good because of the nature of the world. So I, I'm not in agreement with the idea, but I, I at least have some sympathy to it. But I do think that there is a rational basis for ethics. I think it's actually pretty simple. Um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll uh, maybe I'll be proven wrong when, when everybody here walks out and has no idea what I just said. But but I think it's it's actually fairly simple, and it, it is easier and uh, easier to grasp, I think, than the idea that. There's somebody sitting in a chair up in the sky telling us what we ought not not do. And it has way, it has no consequences. It doesn't have the same consequences as religion. So I don't know if that is satisfactory. We can have yeah. as long a conversation about this as you no, want afterward. Go on forever. I was just as curious. Yeah. Tell yeah. me. Okay. okay, I will have another kind of question. <laughs> uh, on different subject. But uh, one month ago, I met Craig Biddle, and we've been talking about the conflict between Ayn Rand and Murray Rothbard uh, in New York. And yeah. he said that um, actually Rand and Rothbard or just Austrians or just the economy, uh, economists should work together because yeah. in this particular subject, he said that Austrian school needed the philosophical background for, uh, for its theory. And I would like to ask you, how do you think uh, important is philosophy when you want to deal only with economics, economical uh, subjects, and so on? Yeah. 
Oh man, that's a, a very rich question. You can't just deal with economics, really. I mean, look what Mises did. His, uh, his treatise on economic calculation, first one to come out, he's written this, you know, he, he's made all the economic arguments against socialism. And he gets to the very end and he says, well, you know, of course this is not gonna be convincing to anyone who agrees with socialism on moral instead of practical grounds. And that's exactly what we're up against. We're up against people who believe in socialism, who believe in communism, who believe in authoritarianism on moral grounds. They think it's moral to force people to do certain things. And so the economist, he's helpful, but if that's all he does, if you like my friend who I told you about earlier, who created this petition against anti-price gouging laws, only makes this practical argument, well, he's gonna run into to opposition because people are not gonna do things that they think are immoral. And this is, I think, the big divide between the Austrians and objectivists. I think Rand very much appreciated Mises' work. But if you go read her marginalia on human action, she's like, no, he's giving away the whole debate right here. He's saying that there's no real basis for rights. You know, they, they did have a falling out because, of course, Rand knew Mises. Mises said that Rand, and she was delighted when he said this, she said that Rand was the bravest man in America before he knew that she was a woman. I did the same thing when I read Atlas Shrugged. I thought she was a man. <laughs> Ayn Rand, yes. Um, but they did have a falling out because, you know, uh, in, in the 70s, Vietnam War, she and, and many of her acolytes were working to get rid of the military draft. And in fact, some of uh, her students were, or at least one, was part of the, the Nixon campaign and helped to get rid of the military draft. Um, Mises didn't have a problem with the draft. And, you know, they would meet up, Henry it's Hazlitt. libertarian, actually, because he believed that there, we need the state, but state should protect the market economy, and that's the only one goal of the state. Yeah. And then Rothbard and Hoppe said that Mises was wrong about this because the state is one of the uh, biggest enemy of the free market. Yeah, I think that what they lacked was a, a principled understanding of what capitalism is and must be. Government, in Rand's view, has one and only one purpose. It's to protect individual rights. What happens when you... Serve, not rule. Sorry? Serve, to serve, serve not, not to rule. Yeah. Government by, of, and for the people. Its, its job is to serve us, not to rule us. And so it should not, you know, uh, conscript people against their will and in, into the military. Um, it, it shouldn't do any of the sorts of things that I think many libertarians are okay with, like, you know, have a welfare state. Um, and I think there are excellent arguments against a government-enforced welfare state. If you go back and look at early America before the progressives sold us on this idea that you have a right to a safety net, that you have a right to not have to ask for charity, actually, America had an incredibly robust charity network, incredibly benevolent people. We still are. We have the highest level of voluntary giving in the world. But you know what? I think it would be a whole lot higher if people weren't forced to give up so, so much of their money for completely ineffective and destructive government programs. And uh, because uh, you said that there are some differences between Austrians and objectivists, but I have to admit that uh, when listening to, for example, Craig's lectures or reading Ayn Rand's books uh, or, or reading Human Action, for example, I could replace the word thinking and acting in both of them and it still, it still would match. So Mises said that you can uh, not act because not acting is also kind of acting because you have to think about this, etc. And the same thing uh, with thinking, that you can stop thinking and uh, decision not to think also requires thinking. Mm. So, so I think that on these two fields, actually, yeah. this, maybe not two philosophies, but these two schools, philosophical and economical, are complying. I think they do align a lot. But as I, uh, as I intimated earlier, there are, I think, deeper philosophic disagreements between Mises and Rand. And they go to epistemology. You know, he uses subjective all the time. It's, it's subjective what you value. It's just, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, well, is it actually subjective what we value or do values have a factual basis? If you just feel like sitting on the couch, eating pizza, doing cocaine, playing video games, is that actually gonna be good for your life? 
Is, is what is good subjective? Or does it have a factual basis in reality? Can we say, well, that person's actually not flourishing. He's, uh, he's living a pretty, pretty damn bad existence. I'm not an economist, so um, I, I can't speak to the, if there are any economic differences between the two. But um, we have over here some books and one of them is Economics and Atlas Shrugged, written by a great economist, Richard Salzman, published by the Objective Standard, where I'm an editor. And uh, I would definitely pick that up. And in fact, you know, please, guys, I don't want to take any of that stuff home. So take everything you want and then some and give it to your friends or just like leave it somewhere where somebody else will find it. You'll put it in the school's library, whatever you want to do with it. I don't care. But just take that stuff and distribute it. And I want to add that students and whoever is going to our fundraiser 6 p.m. Don't take these copies. These copies should go just to people who are only today in the morning because we have much more copies <laughs> for the 6 p.m. That's for the book oh, Loving okay. Life over there. So everything else though, take. Uh, so back to your uh, guy eating pizza, drink cocaine on the couch. Uh, you're saying that Anne Ryan would say that that person could be objectively said to be not committing good. good. Yeah. Versus Mises, who would say maybe I don't, subjective. I don't know what Mises would say in the field of ethics, but I do think that his epistemology and the way that he used right. epistemology in economics was to say that values are subjective. Depends on what the person wants. Well, what he should have said, in, in my opinion, is that values are contextual. They're optional, they're chosen. We can choose to eat pizza or salad, but we need to eat something that will sustain our lives. Yeah. If, we, if we don't, if we eat, if we don't eat or we do drugs, we're gonna kill ourselves. So the field so, movement was a- uh, Oh, well, uh, Rand had- Von Mises uh, derived maybe part of- Nah, uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, I think that that had deeper- small, uh, small fault because uh, there was a discussion on the internet about uh, let's say playfulness that Ayn Rand would accept this and somebody claimed that in Return of the Primitive there was a proof that Ayn Rand wouldn't stop you taking drugs for example but she wouldn't recommend that because right. that's not good for your flourishing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can't stop people from doing things that are well within their rights. But it's, is that good for them? No. So I think we got to conclude. Thank you guys for the questions. Thank you.